Let us pray. Our Father and our God, we thank you for our Bible study today. We thank you for granting us the privilege of returning to the series that we had left off some time ago. We thank you for the grace, thank you for the love, thank you for the interest in your word. We know that as your children, we should be interested in the will, in the word, in the thoughts of our Father. And we come as children today, opened in our heart to listen to you as our Father. We pray that you speak to every one of us in Jesus' name. We pray, O Lord, you will wake us up. That your word will be like water that will cleanse us. Like hammer that will break the rocks in pieces. Like fire that will burn and also that will revive us. We pray, O oh Lord, from above, you send that word to every one of us in Jesus' name. We pray that this word will provide a garment of righteousness that will cover every one of us in Jesus' name. Let the word reveal more of Christ to us. What he was for us on the cross. What he was for us when he rose from the dead. What he is for us now, seated on the right hand side of the Father. We pray, O Lord, that the riches of the kingdom of God, coming through Christ, will come into our lives in Jesus' name. Open our eyes of understanding. Help us to see and to behold, to perceive the mysteries of the kingdom in the world, even tonight, in Jesus' name. May we look away from earthly things, to focus on heavenly things. Help us, Lord, that we may hear you today. And as we hear your word, that word that raises the dead will raise every one of us in Jesus' name. Make us channels of blessing. That this word will pass through from us to other people. As it does good in our lives, it will do good in the lives of other people. Thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. We praise the name of the Lord for our coming together today after some time. The Lord has been blessing us. And you know that we had already studied the epistle to the Hebrews from the first chapter to the ninth chapter. And today we're going to chapter 10. And it's talking about something very important. It's talking about sacrifice. But it's not ordinary sacrifice. It's not even the sacrifices that you have in the Old Testament. We they were sacrificing year after year for many generations. It's a final sacrifice. It's the efficacious sacrifice. It's a perfect sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. Of course, it also talks about the sacrifices of the Old Testament. But he talks about that in making comparison. Actually, he's making a contrast. He wants us to see the old as a shadow. He wants us to see the new as a substance. He wants us to see the old that is passed away. He wants us to see the new that is abiding ever. He wants us to see the weakness, the ineffectiveness, the insufficiency of the old so we can better appreciate the finality of the sacrifice of Christ, the sufficiency of the sacrifice of Christ, and the perfection that we have in the sacrifice of Christ. If you have followed the study that we had in the past, in the epistle to the Hebrews, actually the apostle had been talking about covenants. Principally, he mentions two covenants. One, the old covenant, and second, the new covenant. If he talks about the old and the new as the first and the second, in uh, Hebrews chapter 8, reading from verse 7, it says, For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should not place have been sought for the second. He mentions the first, and then he mentions the second. As I told you, he called them the old and the new that you find in verse 13 of that same chapter, in that he says, a new covenant. He has made the first old. Now that which decays and waxes old is ready to vanish away. And then he compares the old and the new. And he tells us that the new is better than the old covenant. In chapter 8 and verse 6, he tells us, But now, as he, referring to Christ, obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. In the past study, we have uh, made mention of the fact that the epistle to the Hebrews is talking of something better. A better priest. A better high priest. A better sacrifice. 
a better covenant, a better inheritance. All the things you have in the epistle to the Hebrews refers to something better that we have in the kingdom of God as Christ has become the mediator of that better covenant. Actually, as you look at chapter 8 and in verse 6 and it talks of better covenant and the mediator and the better promises, it now gives us reasons from chapter 8 to chapter 9 why the covenant the new covenant is a better covenant number one it tells us that in the new covenant god writes his laws in the hearts of his children in the old covenant the laws were written upon the tables of stone but in the new the laws are written in the hearts of men that is better now number two the service of the old covenant was only a type only a figure of the new and it was limited but in the case of the new covenant it is not limited at all it is not limited to a family it is not limited to a nation it is not limited to a period of time it is not limited to a generation therefore the new is better and then the third reason the old covenant could not perfect those that offer the sacrifices but we know that the sacrifice of jesus christ is the one that now makes us perfect because the old covenant could not make us perfect but the new covenant can make us perfect that means the new is better number four the old covenant was temporary that is it was for just that time but the new covenant remains and abides even until now and until the last soul will be saved that will get to the kingdom of god until the very coming of the lord jesus christ number five the new covenant through christ's sacrifice brought cleansing it brought eternal redemption as well as eternal inheritance which is telling us it is a thing that will transport us from earth and transport us into heaven number six the new covenant was dedicated by the blood of christ you understand the old covenant was dedicated by the blood of animals and as heaven is higher than the earth so the blood of jesus christ is higher than the blood of animals that means then that the new covenant is so much better so much higher so much much greater than the old covenant number seven the old covenant had many sacrifices they offered the sacrifices every time in that holy place but they offered year after year but in the case of the new covenant it has been established on the final perfect efficacious sacrifice of the lord jesus christ with all these reasons in chapters eight and nine the apostle was trying to show to the believers at that time that the new covenant with every consideration looking at every aspect is better than the old covenant but then you will find that he's been talking about christ and it hinges the new covenant on the lord jesus christ that jesus christ is the very center is the very mediator of the new covenant actually as you look at the epistle itself you will find that the epistle is talking about christ christ crucified christ glorified Christ exalted, Christ supreme over everyone else, and he compares him to angels. He compares him to men. He compares him to Moses. He compares him to Aaron. He compares him to Melchizedek. He compares him to Abraham. He compares him to the Levites. He compares him with everyone that had ever lived in generation after generation from the time of Adam. And then he tells us that Jesus Christ is better. He concentrates upon the Lord Jesus Christ. In chapter 1, he tells us that Jesus Christ sits now on the right hand of majesty on high. And is so much made better than the angels. In chapter 2, he tells us that God has put all things under his feet. In chapter 3, he tells us that this Jesus Christ is a faithful high priest and is counted worthy of more glory than that of Moses. In chapter 4, he tells us that this Jesus Christ is greater than all the priests of the old covenant. And then in chapter 5, he tells us that this Jesus Christ is a priest that is of a higher order than that of Aaron. It's in chapter 6, he tells us is the high priest after the the order of Mixedi. Then in chapter 7, he tells us about his life, about his character, about his conduct, and he tells us that he's so much higher than every man you have ever heard about. He tells us that he's holy, he is harmless, 
is undefiled, is separate from sinners, is higher than the heavens, is the surety of a better testament. In chapter 8, is the one that is occupying a place higher than any other, and is therefore the mediator of the new and the better covenant. And then in chapter 9, it tells us that his blood purges the conscience, puts away sin, obtains eternal redemption for every one of us. With all that that has cleared now, that he has covered in chapters 1 all through to chapter 9. He now comes to chapter 10. And it, as he comes to chapter 10, he talks first about the old covenant and then he talks about the Lord Jesus Christ and then he talks about the new covenant. Today we're looking at chapter 10 and we're looking at verses 1 through to 18. And in these verses, we're going to see three definite things. Number one, the shadow and the insufficiency of the old covenant. The shadow and the insufficiency of the old covenant. Number two, submission and sacrifice of Christ. Submission and sacrifice of Christ. Number three, salvation and sanctification in the new covenant. As we look at point number one, let's look at Hebrews chapter 10, reading from verse 1. Hebrews chapter 10, from verse 1. For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never, with those sacrifices which they offered year by year, continually make the commerce thereunto perfect. For then, would they not have ceased to be offered? Because that the worshippers, once purged, should not have, should have had no conscience of sins. But in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. You will see here in uh, this passage that we have read, number one, that the old covenant with all the ceremonies, with all the ordinances, with all the statutes, and with all the sacrifices were just a shadow. Look at it in chapter 10 verse 1. For the law, referring to the law of Moses, and everything centered around that is surrounding uh, the law of Moses, that's the old covenant, having a shadow of things to come. Very clearly then, we understand. As you look at that old covenant, you are just seeing a shadow. But there is something beautiful here. There will be no shadow if there is no reality. There will be no shadow if there is no substance. The very fact that we see shadow means that there is light shining and there is a reality, the substance somewhere. But it tells us that the old covenant is just a shadow of things to come. Look at uh, chapter 8 of Hebrews and in verse 5. Hebrews chapter 8 verse 5 Who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things. Once again he tells us there that it was just a shadow. But it's not only just a shadow. He also tells us of the insufficiency of that old covenant. Look at chapter 10 and in verse 1 again. For the law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things. It tells us that we shouldn't make any mistake. We shouldn't suppose that the old covenant is an end by itself. You've got the old covenant, you've got everything. He said, no, it is not the very image. It is not the very reality. It is not the substance of the things themselves. And then it says, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the commerce the worshippers, the people that made the sacrifices, he could not make them perfect. Therefore, you can tell then, there is insufficiency here. There is incompleteness here. There is imperfection here. There is weakness in that old covenant. That's why we have brought the first title, subtitle, as the shadow and the insufficiency of the old covenant. Look at those verses again and begin to think about all the things you see in the old covenant. You might wonder why are we repeating all these things and why are we saying all these things you know there are people that do not make any difference between the old and the new and they feel that if you are now in the church you are now in a worshiping assembly you should practice everything that you see they do not know there is a part of the world that was given 
to the children of Israel and it was just a shadow. For example, you are going to find people that are going to go into the old covenant and they mention Sabbath, Sabbath, Sabbath. Oh, we say, yes, there, there was Sabbath. It was in the old covenant. It was part of the shadow. Other people will rise up and they will try to give excuse for the sacrifices they are making. And they will say, well, we are doing everything according to the scriptures in our assembly in our church we make sacrifices we kill animals and we make sure that we shed that animal and we read it in the bible yes it is in the bible it was for a limited time a limited period it is part of the old covenant other people are burning incense and they are telling you that well they burn incense but it is part of worship because the Lord has ordained that and commanded that in the Bible. Yes, it's in the Bible, but where is it in the Bible? It's in the Old Covenant. Other people are going to justify their candle burning. And they will say, have you not read your Bible? Why are you opposing what we are doing? Again, you are going to find it that all these things are part of the shadow. In the Old Covenant, other people are rejoicing in their priestly garb. That is, in the priestly garment, the priest the bishops will dress in a particular way and they will even come with their long cap and then when you ask the question why are we doing all this they refer you they say look at the dressing of Aaron look at the dressing of the Levites look at the dressing of the sons of Aaron don't you see when the Lord consecrated them and the things that they did again we understand these are the things that are shadows referring to the things to come many many things that many people are questioning today they will ask us why is it that we just tell everybody to come all the men are there all, all the women are there is there not a time you will have to tell your women don't come to the worship service today if you're going through your regular monthly period stay at home because you're unclean have you not read your bible do you not say you are deeper like bible church don't you believe every verse in the bible then they will open the bible and show the chapter and the verse and tell us why women should not be in the worship assembly when they have that special monthly period once again we remind, we remind them all those things are in the old covenant and all those things have passed away because it was a shadow and it was insufficient with everything I've told you now I want you to read verse 1 again that is Hebrews chapter 10 and in verse 1 for the law having a shadow of good things to come good things to come it is the good thing to come that we're now enjoying what Christ has brought salvation in the Lord full salvation salvation in the Lord, redemption in the Lord, the forgiveness of our sin, the change of life, the new life that a child of God can have now because of the final sacrifice and the perfect sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because of all those things that Christ has brought, now the good things of the kingdom, the riches of the kingdom, and the benefits of the death of Christ, they are now ours because of that. We are not holding to the shadow anymore. We are holding to the substance because... The old covenant was insufficient. He could not make those people perfect. Look at verse 2. For then, would they not have ceased to be offered? That is, if the old covenant and the old sacrifices had made those people perfect, they would have stopped offering them. And because it says in verse 2 that the worshippers, once but, should have had no conscience of sin. But to see every year, they were conscious of their sins. And because of the consciousness of sin, they will come again and lay their hands on the animal and kill the animal again and shed the blood again. And then they'll go back home. The following year, they'll come again and offer that sacrifice again and kill that animal again. They were making a remembrance, a remembrance, a remembrance of the sins every time. But in the case of the Lord Jesus Christ, he has done it for us once and for all. In verse 3, but in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance again made of sins every year, every time. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sin. That's the insufficiency. That's the imperfection. That's the incompleteness of the old covenant. Look at Colossians chapter 2. In Colossians chapter 2, actually what we are looking for is verse 17, but we are going to start from verse 16. So you will see the connection. Colossians chapter 2, reading from verse 16. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holiday or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days. Then it says in verse 7, all these things that he had mentioned in verse 16, which 
are a shadow of things to come. You see that? They were looking for the future time. When the reality will come. When the substance will come. When the perfection will come. When the final sacrifice will come. It says they are a shadow of things to come. And then he tells us but the body, the reality, the substance is of Christ. Now in verse 16 it says, Let no man therefore judge you in meat. It's not thinking, it's not talking of the normal food we're eating. It's talking of the sacrificial meat. If you read the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, what you will find out is that those uh, priests, they will kill the animal and then the Lord will tell them the part the priests are to eat. And the part the people that were making the sacrifices were to eat. That's what he's talking about there as the meat. Actually it's a meat offering. And then he's talking about the drink. He will tell you that when they have all their crops and all their vine, he will tell you that what they were to drink. It was a religious kind of thing. A ceremony that they were doing of an holy holy day that is they'll make some days holy days a uh, this particular day you know in the old covenant in the old testament you will not do any work it's totally dedicated unto the lord even apart from the regular sabbath days then it says of the new moon or of the sabbath days now there are people today in fact i received a letter very recently the fellow had listened to the radio message and he said he was interested and very much challenged then he said but there's only one thing i realize that you are teaching the truth and you are teaching the word of god and i'm always challenged by the things you are saying over the radio but then it's still interesting to me that you have not been worshiping on the saturday on the sabbath day that when you include that saturday worship and you you are no more worshipping on Sunday, then I will know that you are taking the whole Bible. My friend, we are taking the whole Bible. That Sabbath day, that Saturday worship was a shadow pointing to the final rest that we're going to have and when the one represented by the sabbath when he came he said come unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden i will give you rest now there is a rest for the people of god and we have entered into the spiritual sabbath of the lord and he completed that when he rose up on the first day of the week and because of that now we commemorate and we worship because of the resurrection of christ because of the one who has given unto us what the old covenant could not give unto the people all those things of the sabbath all those things of the rituals all those things of the ceremonies they were just a shadow of things to come but the body is of christ we thank the lord we have the reality we have the substance we have christ with us and we have the blessings of the things to come why are you going to be running after the shadow when you have the reality with you if you are born again if you have been cleansed by the blood of the lord jesus christ if you have the reality already i praise the lord for you don't let anybody judge you don't let them take the substance away from you and then give shadow into your hand. Now we talk also about the insufficiency of the old covenant in Hebrews chapter 7. Hebrews chapter 7, reading from verse 18 and verse 19. For there is verily a disannulling, that is a cancellation of the commandment going before, for the weakness and the unprofitableness thereof, for the law, is still talking about the old covenant, made nothing perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope did, by the which we draw near unto God. Therefore now we can enjoy what those people in the old covenant could not enjoy. In chapter 10, look at chapter 10 verse 11. This is very, very clear. Chapter 10 of Hebrews and in verse 11. And every priest standing daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. You see that? Why will you stay with something? Why will you stick with something that will never take away sin? When John already, the second day, saw Jesus coming, and he pointed to him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. When you have the reality and the substance, the Christ that is perfect, that sacrifices his blood and his life for us, that takes away sin, why will you remain with something that will not be able to take away sin? With thank the Lord because the reality has come. That's why the new covenant is centered on Christ. In fact, immediately the apostle here talked about the incompleteness, 
the insufficiency, the imperfection of the old covenant, he moves on to the new covenant and he moves on to the center of the new covenant, which is Christ Jesus our Lord. That leads us to point number two, submission and sacrifice of Christ. Christ came and he came for a particular purpose. He must come because the old covenant could not lead the people perfectly unto God. The old covenant could not make them righteous enough. The old covenant could not give them everything that Adam had lost. Because of that, Jesus Christ had to come. And Jesus came in submission to the will of the Father. And through his submission and sacrifice, now we can have in the new covenant what they could not have in the old covenant. In Hebrews chapter 10, reading from verse 5. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. This is talking about Christ. It's talking about the Messiah. Actually, these had been prophesied in the Old Testament. Because even at the time of the Old Testament, the Lord told them very clearly that he was not going to remain just with the sacrifice, just with the offering. The Messiah will come. The Christ will come. The Lamb of God will come. The man of sorrows acquainted with grief. The chastisement of our peace will be upon him. He will be bruised. And through his stripes, we are going to be healed. The Old Testament knew that they were not at the end of the way. It was just like a signboard pointing to the one to come. And therefore it was in the Old Testament sacrifice and offering. Thou wouldest not, but a body thou hast prepared me. That's the incarnation of the Lord Jesus Christ. God putting on flesh and coming into our world and resting with us there. He came among us there and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father full of grace and full of truth. Look at verse 6, in bond offerings and sacrifices for sin, thou hast had no pleasure. That is, all those people that were bringing their sacrifices, God was just tolerating it. He was just enduring it because he saw their hearts. Their hearts were not broken. Their hearts were not contrite. Their hearts were not fully sincere. And they will just bring that animal. It was a ritual they were doing from year to year. And God was just waiting and he was just saying, the final lamp will come. The Lamb of God will come. The one that will be enthroned, it will come. The one that will shed a pure blood, it will come. The one that will give the fullness of grace, it will come. The one that will give grace and salvation and pure life to the people, it will come. At that time, he was not really desiring the sacrifices and the offerings. He was only tolerating it, waiting for the time when Christ will come. In verse 7, Then said I, Lo, I come. In the volume of Brook, it is written of me to do thy will, O God above when he said sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin thou wouldest not neither hast thou pleasure therein which are offered by the law that is all those sacrifices which were offered in the old covenant he had no pleasure in them only tolerating them waiting for when the perfect sacrifice will come then he said lo this is the messiah this is Christ. This is the Lamb of God. This is the very Son of God. He said, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the force, that's the old covenant, that he may establish the second. That is the new covenant. Let's see where this passage was quoted from in the Old Testament. The Old Covenant in um, Psalm 40, reading from verse 6. Psalm 40, verse 6 sacrifice and offering thou didst not desire mine ears thou hast opened burnt offering and sin offering as thou not required then said i lo i come in the volume of the book it is written of me i delight to do thy will O oh my god yea thy law is within my heart who is this one talking? No other one, but the one that said, I came not to do my own will, 
but the will of my father who has sent me lo in the volume of the book it is written of me i come to do thy will O god who is this one that is telling us i come to do thy will is the one that said my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work who is this one that is saying i come to do thy will O god is the one that said if this cup may not pass by me except i drink it thy will be done he was dedicated he was surrendered he was yielded he was consecrated to doing the will of god and the will of god alone he submitted himself he surrendered himself to doing the will of god in matthew chapter 26 this is a familiar passage to you but open your bible and let's read together in matthew chapter 26 and in verse 39 and he went a little farther and fell on his face and he prayed saying oh my father if it be possible let this cup pass from me nevertheless nevertheless not as i will but as thou wilt this is the one that said all the sacrifices of the old covenant you don't want them you don't desire them you don't appreciate them you're only tolerating them you are eagerly waiting for the time when i will come to do your will when i will come and i will make the final sacrifice and now the time of the final sacrifice was about to come and he said not as i will but as thou wilt you will see that this was the submission of the lord to the will of the father he humbled himself even to the very death of the cross in philippians chapter 2 reading from verse 5 it says let this might be in you which was also in christ jesus who being in the form of god he thought it not trouble to be equal with god he made himself of no reputation he put upon him the form of his servant that's for submission that's for yieldedness that's for giving himself that's for not doing his will that's to do the will of the father only and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man he humbled himself he surrendered himself he yielded himself he submitted himself and he became obedient obedient to the will of the father unto death even the death of the cross that's where he made the final sacrifice you see the apostle he had been appealing many times to the old testament because he was talking to these jewish people these hebrew people that were still holding on to the old covenant and he was telling them let go surrender that give that up there is something better here christ has come there is no salvation in any other but in the name of jesus the lamp of god the final perfect sacrifice had been given he had surrendered himself for us why will you still be holding on to the shadow when the substance is already here and then he reminded them that even in the old testament the sacrifices really in themselves were not pleasing unto God. In fact, there was a time that the Lord was very clear unto them and told them not to bring all those sacrifices anymore unto them because they were not bringing them with a sincere heart, with a willing mind in the way that he had ordained. Look at Isaiah chapter 1. Isaiah chapter 1 verse 12. When ye come to appear before me, who has required this at your hand to tread my cause bring no more vain oblations incense is an abomination unto me the new moons and the sabbath the calling of assembly i cannot away with it is iniquity even the solemn meeting your new moons your appointed feasts, my soul hateth they are a trouble unto me i am weary to bear them i want you to think for a moment even before the new covenant came even before christ came even before the efficacious sacrifice of jesus christ was made even at the time when the old covenant was still in force even at that time when the old covenant had not been cancelled the lord said stop it it's not useful it's useless you're not coming with the right heart you're not coming with the right mind all these things that we are doing the incense the new moon the sabbath the calling of assembly i cannot i cannot even tolerate them before the end of the old covenant even though the new had not arrived i cannot tolerate them anymore there is so much iniquity 
there is so much hypocrisy and there is so much sin and transgression mixed with it stop it i don't want it again let me ask you a question if at the time when the old covenant was still standing at the time when the old covenant was still in force they were not coming with the right heart and god says stop it how much more now when the old covenant has passed away when the old covenant is annulled when the old covenant is cancelled when the new covenant has now come if anybody now comes he comes with incense he comes with candle he comes with the blood of animals he's not wearing shoe he's wearing some kind of white garment he's a fasting according to the old testament injunction and ordinances he's having a day of atonement he's having all those things even at the time when the thing was still in place the lord says stop it there's too much hypocrisy and iniquity how about now when the old covenant is totally gone is totally forgotten and the new covenant has come the lord is telling us the reality has come drop the old thing the substance has come drop the shadow he told them the reason why he couldn't listen to them and while those sacrifices were not acceptable in his sight he tells us in Isaiah chapter 1 verse 15 and when you spread your hands i will hide my eyes from you yea when ye make many prayers i will not hear your hands are full of blood you see there is sin why the lord will not even accept them but in those old in that time of the old testament what was the lord actually looking for not just the mere sacrificing of animal anybody could do that not just the shedding of the blood of an animal anybody could do that not just the burning of an incense anybody could do that not just the wearing of a particular kind of a ministerial garb almost anybody could do that what was the lord looking for isaiah chapter uh, sorry psalm 51 in psalm 51 reading verse 16 and verse 17 psalm 51 verses 16 and 17 for thou desirest not sacrifice else i would i give it thou delightest not in bunch offering can you see this over and over and over again even at the time of the old covenant not to talk of the time of the new covenant now the lord is telling us there through the leaves of uh, david and he said you don't desire sacrifice you do not desire even these burnt offerings in verse 17 the sacrifices of god are a broken spirit and a broken and a contrite heart oh god thou wilt not despise can you see then it was necessary that christ will come it was necessary that christ will come to shed his blood and effect and establish and accomplish the new covenant so that anybody coming now will come through that sacrifice of jesus christ the perfect sacrifice the complete sacrifice the final sacrifice the efficacious sacrifice the ultimate sacrifice that the heavenly father had been waiting for eventually he came and now that he has come anyone can come to god through the lord jesus christ come to hebrews again hebrews chapter 9 reading from verse 26 hebrews chapter 9 verse 26 for then must see often as suffered since the foundation of the world listen to this second part but now once in the end of the world as he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself now he has appeared what has he appeared to do to put away sin that's what the old testament could not do that's what the old covenant could not do oh yes their sins were covered and you know there were some of them like enoch that went beyond their generation that went beyond their dispensation and they were uh, elijah uh, so elijah and enoch were even transported translated into heaven without seeing death that was not for their age that was not for their time that was not for the old covenant in reality it was just that there are some people that had double spiritual promotion that they went beyond their time and beyond their covenant and they were translated into heaven without seeing death but only a few of them and when you talk of full salvation when you talk of cleansing when you talk of perfection there were a few of them you think of samuel you think of daniel you think of isaiah you think of jeremiah you think of daniel you think of a few of them that went beyond the rest of the people 
their sins were cleansed their sins were taken away in fact they had real holiness and real perfection when you look at their lives you think about job and you know that he was a special person a unique person but that was not the general thing in their age but now what happened to those special people think about it what happened to enoch is not going to happen to the whole of the church what happened to Elijah? Going to heaven without seeing death, that's not going to happen to the whole of the church. And now what happened to people like Samuel, people like Daniel, and people like Jeremiah, and people like Isaiah, that now they had that cleansing and that perfection that all their sins were taken away, and they lived lives above reproach. What happened to just a few of them that went beyond their age is not going to happen to the whole church. That is the beauty of what Christ has come to do. And we're told that Jesus Christ has given himself, has offered himself so that now we can have the benefit of the new covenant. Now, all this happened because of his submission. All this happened because of his sacrifice. But then we're being told now that sacrifice produced something. The sacrifices of the Old Testament produced something. What was that? The Old Covenant. But then the final sacrifice of Jesus Christ is also producing something. And what is it? The New Covenant. That brings us now to point number three. Salvation and sanctification in the New Covenant. Salvation and sanctification in the New Covenant. I want you to look at Hebrews chapter 10. We're reading it from verse 10. And look at the verses very well because they tell us something. Something very, very important. In verse 10, it says, By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. I want you to please notice those last three words at the end of verse 10. Once for all. What does that tell us? That the sacrifice of Jesus Christ is not a repeated sacrifice. It's not a sacrifice that he needs to make every year, like the old covenant, just once. But then it says it is not once just for a person. It is not once just for a family. It is not once just for a nation. Once for all. That is all people anywhere, everywhere. That sacrifice of Jesus Christ in all generations that will follow in all nations of the world, with all the believers that will ever come, until the trumpet will sound, that sacrifice has been made once, never to be repeated, and then it is for all, it is for everyone. And then in verse 11, and every priest stand uh, daily, referring to the old ministry, and offering often times the same sacrifices, which can never take away sin. But this man, the Messiah, the Christ, our Lord Jesus Christ, after he had offered one sacrifice for sin forever, sat down on the right hand of God. Please, I want you to understand again. He says he offered one sacrifice. The emphasis is there. All the time, remember that single death on the cross of Calvary is the death, is the sacrifice that will save Anyone that wants to be saved from that time 2,000 years ago until now, until when the Lord will come, one sacrifice. You don't need any other sacrifice now. That final one, that perfect one, that efficacious one, the final sacrifice at make. One sacrifice for sin. And then it says forever. That is the effect of that sacrifice will start in your heart now, will start in your life now. When you believe on the Lord, it will go on and on and on until you enter to the very presence of God and it is because it's your substitute. That substitution on the cross, that sacrifice on the cross is the thing that will present you before the Father and then you enter into eternal glory of God. One sacrifice for sin and is forever. And then he sat down on the right hand of God. If you look at your old covenant, the Old Testament, you're going to find something. The priest never had a seat in the temple. You see the seat we have on top here. If you went to the temple at that time of the Jewish people, you'll never find a seat there. Why? Because the priest had no chance to sit down. 
you will come bring your animal the offer you will come bring your animal then you'll offer they kill so much uh, so many animals that the blood will run and run and will be very thick and will be flowing until it will get to river kidron it was so much they did it every time they did it every year there was no chance of sitting down but jesus christ because he doesn't need to repeat it and repeat it and repeat it he made one sacrifice he made it for sins he made it efficacious forever and now he's seated he's seated on the right hand of god in verse 13 from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made is put to it is that same sacrifice that dealt with sin that also dealt with satan that dealt with demons that dealt with all his enemies now you see his speech his heels had been bruised and because of that the head of the devil has been bruised already when he said it is finished it was a final blow on the devil all he's waiting for now is for the timetable of god to have its place until all his enemies shall be made his footstool in verse 14 once again for by one offering why is he repeating it he doesn't want us to forget he wants us to see that the uniqueness of the new covenant in verse 10 he had already told us that it is just the offering of the body of christ once and then in verse 12 he tells us it is one sacrifice and now in verse 14 he's telling us it is one offering can you miss that it is once for all it is one sacrifice forever and it is one offering that has now perfected them that has sanctified whereof the holy ghost also is a witness to us for after he had said before this is the covenant i will make with them after those days says the lord i will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds i will write them and their sins and iniquities i will remember no more now where the remission where remission of this is there is no more offering for sin very clearly then in the word of god we're told that it is one sacrifice do you know that uh, the the catholic church for example will say in their in the assembly that every time they're taking the lord's supper it's like a repeated sacrifice of the lord jesus christ they say that when those priests when they blessed uh, the the elements or the things they are going to take the bread the unleavened bread as well as uh, the vine the wine they say that it turns to the body of christ and the blood of jesus christ and all those people that are taking it they are now taking it as a new sacrifice again so in their mind in their own understanding every time they are taking that communion every time they are taking that lord's supper there is a repetition of the sacrifice of jesus christ but the bible says no it is once for all it is one unique final sacrifice and it is one efficacious perfect offering that he has done and now that takes away all our sins now you are found here there are two things there are many many things but there are two things that are mentioned here number one is salvation through the sacrifice of the lord jesus christ Number two is sanctification through the blood and the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at the reality of the salvation we have through the sacrifice of the Lord in verse 17. And their sins and iniquities I will remember no more. You have forgiveness, you have cleansing, you have salvation, you have the peace of God. The forgetfulness that is the for, uh, forgetting of all your sins they are forgiven and forgotten he doesn't even remember them against you anymore that is the benefit we have through the sacrifice of the lord jesus christ and if you will come to the lord jesus today and you do that by faith and you say lord i do not come with any other sacrifice i do not come with my own good works I do not come with any animal. I do not come with any gift or talent. I do not come with any present in my hand. All I come with is the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. He did it for me on the cross of Calvary. He didn't sacrifice for himself. He sacrificed for me. And on the basis of the blood he shed for me, I come unto you now. I believe. I accept. I take everything that he did on the cross that it was for me at that moment every sin big and small 
terrible, great, whatever it is you have done, everything will be forgiven, everything will be forgotten, and your sins will never have any record, any remembrance in the sight of the Lord. That's forgiveness. That's salvation. That's renewal. That's a change of life. He makes you a new creature. And all things totally change in your life. But then there's a second thing. That second thing is called sanctification. Now there are people that have a lot of misconception. They give the, the matter of salvation. They leave that in the hands of the Lord. And they say, Lord, they, know I, they say, I know I cannot save myself. It will take your grace. It will take the sacrifice of the Lord to, to save me. But then, after they have been saved, they now need to be sanctified. They need to be made holy. They need to be dedicated and separated totally, entirely, unto the Lord. And they are thinking that they can do that by themselves. They say, their salvation, the Lord did that. Their sanctification, they are going to do that. And they think, as I read the Bible, if I can read very much, and I can double my reading, if I can memorize the Bible, and if I can try my best to walk according to the Bible, and I will not look at the faces of people, I'll be looking down, and I will try to be gentle, I will try to be humble, I'll try to give everything I have to people gradually, in a progressive manner, little by little, day by day, as I'm learning, as I'm walking, as I'm behaving myself, I know then that I will be sanctified. No, you are taking that sanctification away from the hand of the Lord, and you are thinking you are the one to do it. Salvation comes through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And sanctification as well comes through the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at it in verse 10 again. By the which will were sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Look at verse 14. For by one offering he has perfected forever them that are sanctified. There are people that will tell us, so yes, that is positional sanctification. What they mean is that, oh yes, everybody is already sanctified. No prayer, no consecration, no change of life, no uprooting of the Adamic nature, no removal of the stony heart, no implanting of the heart of flesh, no circumcision of the heart, no purity of the heart. They say, all the believers, everybody, the moment you are born again, the moment you are saved, you are also sanctified. No, sir. Because Jesus Christ prayed for the sanctification of his disciples. They had been saved. He said they were not of the world, even as he was not of the world. Then he said, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. It is the work of the Lord himself. In Hebrews chapter 2, reading from verse 11. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 11. For both he that sanctified and they who are sanctified... You see, when it says, they who are sanctified, that's a complete, an accomplished thing. It's a finalized thing. It's not that they are being sanctified, or they will be sanctified, or by and by when they die, and they get to heaven, at the gate of heaven before they enter, the Lord will sanctify them. No, not at all. He speaks of it as something accomplished, as something done as something already effected, as something they already possess, and he attributes it to the Lord himself. And he says, he that sanctified, and they who are sanctified, accomplish what? Then it says, they are all of one, for which cause is not ashamed to call them brethren. We become more intimate with the Lord in the family of God as we become sanctified. You understand that sanctification is the will of God. That's in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 3. It is the provision of Christ. He, Christ, that he might sanctify the people he suffered without the gate. is the provision of Christ. It is the work of the Spirit. Look at it. This may not be a familiar passage unto you. Hebrews chapter 15. Hebrews chapter 15 and in verse 16. The point I'm making is that the blessed trinity is involved with our sanctification. It's the will of God the Father. It's the provision of the Son of God, Jesus Christ. And then it is the work of the Spirit of God, of the Holy Ghost. In Romans chapter 15 and in verse 16. That I should be the minister of, the, of, the gen, of uh, Jesus Christ to the Gentiles. Ministering the gospel of God that the offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable, 
being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. Now, you need to read this verse carefully. There is a little word here. If you miss that word, you are going to miss the meaning of this verse. It's the latter part of verse 16. Look at it very carefully. That the offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable, being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. Now, the little word that you need to take note of is the word up. Up. If you remove that word up, Let's remove that and read it now and see what it means if you remove the word up. You read it this way, that the offering of the Gentiles might be acceptable, being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. What does that mean? It means the offering, the presentation, the things that the Gentiles have in their hand, they come to bring to the Lord will be acceptable and will be sanctified by the Holy Ghost. That's because you remove the word up. But now put the word up, put it back there, that the offering up of the Gentiles, that means the Gentiles themselves, coming to the Lord, offering themselves, giving themselves. When you give yourself up, you offer yourself up unto the Lord, that the Gentiles who had been saved, who had been born again, that the offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable and these Gentiles that offer them and give themselves up to the Lord might be sanctified by the Holy Ghost. So we understand that when we talk about sanctification, it is the will of God. It is the provision of Christ and it is the work of the Spirit. How do you get this sanctification? You must desire it. My heart panting after the Lord as the heart panted after the water bruise. How do you get this sanctification? I desire nothing but to see the face of the Lord. Whom do I have in heaven or whom do I have on earth except thou, O Lord? I am eager to see the Lord. I want to be conformed to the image of the Lord. I want to follow the example of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want a perfect life. I want a holy life. I want a spiritual life. I desire it more than silver or gold, more than anything on earth. That desire must be in you before the Lord will sanctify you. Then you consecrate yourself. You offer yourself up to the Lord. You give yourself up to the Lord. You consecrate yourself to the Lord. And then you pray. Because ye have not. Because uh, ye ask not. And when you ask, you ask in faith. Let him ask in faith. Nothing will bring. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea. Let him not think he will receive anything from the Lord. But you come. And you come in faith, whatsoever you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them, and ye shall have them, and then after that, you will live the life of Christ. You look at the mirror every day, and you see Jesus Christ, and you say, Jesus, now that I'm saved, now that I'm sanctified, help me to live in thought, in mind, in will, in my emotion, in my disposition, in my action, in my deeds, in my utterances, in every way, in every day. Help me live according to the Lord Jesus Christ who has sanctified me because there is a perfect will of God. Your sanctification, total conformity unto the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe that blood of Jesus Christ is still available today. It's still efficacious today. The sacrifice, it will never lose its power. Everyone that comes, if you have not been born again, you will be born again. All your sins will be taken away. If you have been saved, he will transform your heart. He will change your heart. He will implant in you the heart of flesh. He will take the heart of stone. He will take it away. And then the joy of your life, the glory of your Christian experience, you will be totally conformed unto the image of Christ. Don't you want it? Don't you want the Lord in his fullness, in his majesty, in his glory, living within you? He can do it if you would allow him. Let go and let God. Let's rise up and let us tell the Lord, I yield. No more struggling. No more fighting. No more argument. No more struggling with you. I let go. I surrender. I yield myself. Abandon those sacrifices of the old covenant. Abandon all those rituals, all those ceremonies, all those ordinances of the old covenant. Wearing of the white garment and not wearing shoe and burning incense and burning candle. Abandon all those things and call upon the name of the Lord. There is no salvation in any other but the name of Jesus. It is the name of Jesus. It is the blood of Jesus. 
it is the sacrifice of Jesus it is the righteousness of Jesus he is your savior he is your substitute it's the one that has borne the penalty of your sin call upon him oh my Lord Jesus my savior be my savior if you have never given your life to the Lord Jesus Christ do it today do it today you'll be happy eternally you'll be forever happy because he will take away your sins he will remember them no more he will forgive you he will forget everything he will put your sins in the depths of the sea never to be remembered again why will you not call upon the Lord why will you not seek the face of the Lord oh Lord forgive me tell the Lord oh Lord save me tell the Lord oh Lord cleanse me tell the Lord the blood of Jesus Christ can make you whiter than snow can wash you brighter cleaner holier than any of the people of the Old Testament and then you can come back to the Lord after you have been saved Lord purify me Lord sanctify me Lord purge my conscience Lord remove the Adamic nature oh Lord take away the stony heart oh Lord give me the heart of flesh oh Lord circumcise my heart oh Lord make me holy oh Lord make me pure oh Lord make me conform to the image of Christ you can become like Enoch you can become like Elijah you can become like Daniel all those people of the old covenant that went beyond their generation and they got something that belongs to us they got it when it was not their time now it's our time now it's our own covenant it's a new covenant it's coming to you today why don't you tell the Lord oh Lord do it for me do you like this condition in which you are are you totally conformed to the image of Christ are you everything that you ought to be don't you want to be whiter than snow don't you want to be cleaner than you are now? Don't you want to be purer, purer than diamond? Don't you want to be holy and pure and sanctified and poured and purified? And saying, Lord, I want my heart, I want my heart all to be totally conformed to the very image of Christ. He will do it. He will do it if we allow him. Let go and let God. Are you holding on to anything? Are you holding on to some rituals of the old covenant? All those things have been disannulled. They have been taken away. They have been removed. Now call upon the Lord. And the Lord will have mercy upon you. He will sanctify you. He has made that one sacrifice. That one offering by which we are sanctified today. Is the will of God. Is the provision of Christ. Is the work of the Spirit of God.